played on was uh, with Rick Hall here producing, I think, or Arthur Alexander. Better move on. That's the first time I'd overdubbed, and I remember sharing a microphone with the three singers, Herschel Wigginton, Sandra Posey. There's one other person, I can't remember the name. And I think we shared a mic, and I remember playing real low. I don't think you probably hear it on the record, but I think, well, the best I can do is play for these singers. We're out there, and I don't, I don't think we had headphones, maybe. We're a long way from the yeah, source. Those speakers. Those speakers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that was in the uh, Rick's warehouse fame studio over on Wilson and, Down Road. Uh, <clears throat> my first recording session was Arthur Alexander, a black guy that was a bellhop at the, uh, at the Sheffield Hotel. <clears throat> and uh, we were doing You Better Move On. And... Uh, I was using the bathroom for an echo chamber, and so you couldn't take a crap, you know, because <laughs> you, you, you'd you ruin the sound if you, if you took a crap, yeah. <laughs> especially if it was a big one. <clears throat> but uh, we had my band and accumulation of two or three other musicians that were, it was special musicians in my mind, I thought they were better than some of the members of my band. We had Pennant Montgomery on acoustic guitar. We had uh, uh, David Briggs on piano. And Spooner, I think, was playing organ. Was you not, was you playing organ on that? Uh, on the author's record? Yeah. 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 Uh, that was the first overdub of it. Yeah. And then, so I used my, my guitar bass amplifier to run the echo chamber. So when we, when we weren't recording, <clears throat> we could use the bathroom. And when we were recording, you had to call time out and say, look, I want to use the bathroom. <laughs> that, was, that was the way it went. <laughs> what about if you, what was it, if you needed more guitar to scoot the mic up toward the amp? Yeah, good point, good point, Rob. <laughs> We had, uh, Arthur was singing on the same microphone. We only had one Telefunken microphone in the house, and that's all we could afford. And so when Arthur was singing, he was sitting on a stool singing into the <coughs> Telefunken microphone. And uh, uh, when I needed more Peanut, Peanut was on the other side of the microphone playing acoustic guitar. Ching, 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 ching. And so when we wanted more guitar, we'd have to have Peanut scoot in a little and back, Arthur back off a little, et cetera, et cetera, until we got the, the proper sound volume-wise that we needed. So it was, it, was, it was tough. It was tough in those days. You did away with mixing, though, didn't it? Did away with mixing. When you, when you got through <laughs> with, the, with the album or single that you were cutting, you took it with you when you left. It wasn't one of these things where we'll ship it to you later and then you send us some money and that kind of thing. It didn't happen. We were, uh, we, we wanted, we demanded the money before we let the tape go. I think my first session, what you would call a session, uh, was with Rick at his studio, Fame. And Rick had picked out a instrumental song that he wanted to record. And the name of that song was uh, Windy and Warm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, um, so I really didn't know what to play, but he showed me the beat to play. He says, ba bon da 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 ba bon da 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 And I said, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> and there was uh, Billy Cofield playing the, uh, the flute and uh, I can't remember who else was playing on it, but uh, I learned a big lesson from that uh, from that uh, uh, that session. I was so glad it was the first record that I that I had ever played on it that I held in my hands. And finally, when I got it, I put it on the turntable and listened to myself. I'm, I'm loving myself, but I kept hearing this little. <laughs> I thought, well, what the hell could that be? I kept listening. So I listened. The, the, the bass drum, which is the drummer used, ba-boom, 
Well, I would hear it about the time the, the thing would go ba boom. Squeak, so squeak. so uh, I learned that day to oil the bass drum pedal before <laughs> yes. ever uh, recording. Always do that. <laughs> what about you, Jim? I was, I was working for Rick at Fame Studios, and uh, I engineered my first hit record on my first, one of the first sessions. It was uh, the Gants from Mississippi, and the song was Roadrunner, and it sold about 800,000 records on Liberty. And I, th man, I mean, you know, as Rick said, I was shitting in high cotton. Mm-hmm. Really. Where well, mine was Terry Woodford and the Mystics. We went to Fame, got down there on a Sunday, and Rick wasn't there. We broke in. He had a piece of plywood on against the wall where the, the door that goes to the storage room now, but that was just went outside. That uh huh. And we went in and called him on his own telephone. And said, Rick, we're down here. Come. So we cut. Where is my little girl? With yeah. Terry Woodford and the Mystics. That was my first recording session. That's about 1963 or four. And then <clears> my first <throat> money session was Warm and Tender Love with Percy Sledge. And it was a gold record. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was yeah. May 15th, 1966. Progressing, progressing right along. So y'all guys have played uh, a lot together over the years. What was the first session that you all were on the same uh, session. Gosh, I don't. Know. I don't have a clue. There was a lot of them. I think. Uh, I think one of them was. Uh, oh, I, I don't know if it was a. I just thought of I'm your puppet for a minute, but uh, that was Dan's mm -hmm. uh, thing. And uh, but that's the one that David played trombone on. Yeah, that was 1966. Yeah. Yeah, that was. Dan, Dan wasn't. He wrote the song him and Spooner, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but. Uh, it was a guy from Florida that came up Papa and actually Don. produced Papa Don, Papa Don Schroeder. Mm -hmm. And Papa Don was, uh, uh, you know, he was he had a lot of talent, but but he needed his talent. He needed to use his talent when he wasn't high on something. <laughs> and so he, he used a, a, a pint fruit jar full of pills. And so yeah. he, he, he got... He, he he was he was he was on me so bad and he got on under my skin so bad that I turned the session over to Dan and said I don't want any part of it. And uh, uh, back then I couldn't stand a drunk man when I was sober, or a sober man when I was drunk. So <laughs> so he, so so Dan moved in and helped him finish the session. And I don't know if Dan they worked it out I guess, but. I don't know if Dan was the producer of the session, or Don, or both of them, or what. I don't know how it went down, but uh, I, I wanted to get out of there. It went down all night, I know that. Later on, was, I wanted to get out of there, too. It yeah. was, it was, it was mm -hmm. forever. It was forever. Long well, session, yeah. The other thing that happened on that session was uh, Barry Beckett came in. That was the first time? The first time. Yeah, That's right. That's when I but met him. He worked yeah. for Papa Don. Yeah, what was, uh, what was your first impression of Barry? Well, he's a great player, you know. I'm on that particular song. I'm your puppet. He's, I'm playing piano. And he's playing organ. We're playing together. So, and you can hear the record what he did. But he's playing good. And mm -hmm. yeah, he had about then, twenty uh, ice cream sandwiches too. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of them. For yeah, me. A lot of those. A lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Man, a lot of them. Hard to uh, say. What was the one that was the most difficult? That well, I think one of the first ones that David played and lost was uh, Tell Mama. Probably so. You know, yeah. that we we're, all we're, played we're together. As a, we're as a group. Mm -hmm. With Etta James. Uh, yeah. That was a fun. Oh, and that was, was a fun, fun session, too. That was fun. And uh, Leonard Chess was in the control room with Rick. Yeah. Yeah, Leonard came down here and brought her down here with him, and it was in the July or August. It was really hot. And... Etta came down here and she had a full length <laughs> fur coat on and four or five poodles and her boyfriend. And she was she was she was she was pregnant at the time. And the boy wrote, I uh, I'd rather go blind. 
uh, I don't know when he wrote it, but he brought it in and she had had me to play it. And I thought it was a hit record, so we we cut it. And uh, but the one thing I want to tell about Roger, Roger was always on me about he was wanting to play the back beat on the kick drum. <laughs> and I, I wasn't having no part of it because it was like, <laughs> I just couldn't feel it. It was like a one-legged man trying to dance, you know. And so I thought, well, uh, I don't want to do that, Raj. I, I, I don't like that, so let's, let's do something else. So he said, well, one day I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut a hit record and I'm going to call it to your attention. So when they went to New York with Aretha, they did Chain of Fools and First thing he done when he came back was pointed it out to me and said, "By the way, I want you to hear the kick drum." <laughs> <laughs> but that goes per song. I mean, that, it, yeah. that wouldn't have what I was doing wouldn't work on Rick's production. I mean, even if he'd let me, you'd have been sorry later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think. I think. One of the most difficult sessions I ever done was with Paul Anka, You Have My Baby, which was a number one record, but uh, it was tough. He was a tough taskmaster. Mm -hmm. And he uh, he wanted things the way he, the way he wanted them, and you couldn't change it much. He had, a, I, I, I think he had a tremendous ego, but uh, I, I did too at the time, you know, so we, we were pretty good matches. I think the toughest one we had over at Sound was Doug Kershaw. <laughs> I t yeah, that. Buddy Killing brought him in for a week. You know, the fiddling, Cajun, Cajun, Cajun fiddling. fiddler. And, uh, yeah, I remember him. And I remember Barry was trying to take the chord chart, and we found out, realized after about four hours, <laughs> that he couldn't play the song the same way twice. He would tell us that we were wrong, you know. We'd, <laughs> no, you did it so and so. Okay. And Barry would say, "Oh, okay. Let me take this we'll down do it again." again yeah. So and he says, I, "I've got it." He said, "I've got it." And it went one, two, three, four, and it's rocking. And then all of a sudden, uh, he says, "No, no, that's not it." And this goes on for <laughs> hours, and we'd reform, it would reform everything, and he would he would get lost. Is what it. He was what on to 90 him? straight one-niners with pills. Mm, mm, he, he, was, he was some kind of downers or something. That's the only th only session we were played up, we <laughs> played on where everybody just stopped and went home. Yeah. Just quit. Yeah. But right, right at the end, we all Buddy got Killen, scared that Fred Hughes was going to cut us. Later. He had this knife. <laughs> and then we came back to the office, scared us all to mm. death. <laughs> That's really only the only bad. That's session. the only really bad one I can really remember. It's really the only that one bad. we really didn't please at all. I mean, we didn't, <laughs> didn't please him at all. Was there ever a record release from that? No, no. Not that, I don't we, we didn't get one track cut. No, because <laughs> he couldn't play it the same way. It was a sad day for me, and I guess a happy day for the guys. You know. Well, they it wasn't fun. happy for us. Either, I don't think. <laughs> they, they were, they continued to have big hit records, and of course I was uh, at bringing a new group of people, musicians, and almost start over, you know, so. Well, I'll tell you how we really felt. We felt like Rick could hit, cut hits with anybody. We really did. I mean, he's cutting hits with the first group, and then our group, and anybody he ever worked with, we knew he could. And, uh, but we just wanted, to own our own place, you know. And he did it real quick, too. And I'll tell you, after we got over there, <laughs> it was did. like we wondered, what the hell have we done? You know, we, I mean, I'm going to tell you, we, we had some uh, tough days at, in the beginning. What, what led y'all to buy that particular studio that Fred Beavis had done? He offered it to us for sale. That's mm -hmm. the only one we could have got. It was there. And he yeah. stayed on the note with us. <laughs> we didn't have any money to speak of. Well, you and I did have some money. We had, yeah, gosh, I'm up to, a, I think it's real high. We're up there. 3000 each. Uh, I don't remember it being that big. I remember it's on 3500 each. Was I it? Remember, yeah. I thought it was 1500 And it was, we, we paid him 7000 down, and he had to carry 40000 And that he stayed on the note with us. And we never let him down. Let's let it go, Grace. 
Well, we had to convert the board to an eight track board. I mean, with a, you know, we had to be compatible with Atlantic. And uh, so he, we got a Scully eight track machine and he and Paul Kelly converted our board where it would work. And then we got a two track, actually in a mono and a two track. And that's basically it. And, and that's what we did for years. I mean, we did more tracking than we did finishing records. And that happened for a long time, mm -hmm. didn't it? I mean, we would track 50 albums a year and then they'd go finish it somewhere else. And then a year later it'd come out. Sometimes we wouldn't even remember playing on it. You know? what, wasn't that the, the principal difference between Fame and Muscle Show Sound was Rick was a production house and y'all were a track house? Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And absolutely. then we slowly got into publishing and productions, which you know, <laughs> put us finishing records too. But it took two or three years for that to happen. Now, the cosmetic changes we made to Beavis' studios, we tacked up burlap on all the battles. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the I ceiling. The ceiling. <laughs> and we were thinking, what have we done? <laughs> and we named it the Burlap Palace. I know my fingers were so sore <laughs> from the tuck of that burlap in, in the, <laughs> for those baffles. Tucking it in, putting the nail in. Remember it. the police with came washers, by. With washers, big washers. <laughs> Sheffield police came by one night, and they wanted to know if we had a license for a dance. Because <laughs> they all saw and the we cars said, the parking but, lot. But this is not a dance. This is a recording studio. And the guy says, "A recording station?" <laughs> we said, "Yeah." I mean, I mean, they didn't even understand what we were doing. And, but within, you know, a period of time, the police got real friendly with us and they'd come to all the sessions. Yeah, they'd hang out. And uh, they realized we were legit, you know. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what I felt about it. I was really nervous about it because they were cutting all of these big acts. And, I, of course, I was doing Wilson Pickett and some things, you know, and the Osmonds and... Bobby Gentry and Tom Jones and different ones, but but uh, I thought when they well, I thought when they moved from that studio down into the, the river, I figured well I've got it made now because they won't get that sound back. That nobody will ever get that sound back like they had it up there, because I had cut an album on Candy Staten over there with them after we made up and all got back on the same track, and. Uh, it may, it might have been one of the best albums I ever cut on Candy. I thought it was it was sound wise, and, and the part of it, the big part of it, was that these guys were they were all producers in their own mind. I mean, in in my mind too. Uh, Roger would say, "Look, I, what what about if I put a tambourine on there?" And Jimmy would say, "Look, I got a great idea for a guitar." You know, and they were helpful. They weren't just pickers. They they helped you produce the records, and so that that album was uh, was made me a believer that man, they know, they don't need to ever leave this building, you know. And when they did, I thought, boy, they've they've messed in their nest. Well, we really didn't want to, but the doctor that owned the place, uh, he, he wanted to charge so much for it, and we we wanted to buy it. Well, he stuck the price up so high, we had to move. Was that Mullendore? Yeah, mm -hmm. and Dr. Mullendore. Well. And uh, he found out how valuable the studio was to us, and then he stuck it to us, and we just mm -hmm. couldn't afford to buy it. We'd mm -hmm. already bought land on both sides of that building to, to put a mm -hmm. you know, whole complex there, more studios. And four or five roofs. <laughs> you know, everything. <laughs> back porch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the coolest part was our back porch test. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Oh, yeah. People would drive by there, and we'd all be on the back porch standing there, and they wondered, what the heck are all these people on that porch standing there? And we was listening to a playback. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, we got accused of a lot of things as to, <laughs> to what we were actually doing. Well. <coughs> which wasn't true. When we, <laughs> Sometimes it was. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> well. <laughs> But when when, uh, when we had uh, when we were we were going great guns with the fame, you know, <coughs> when that all took place, 
And I recall we had, uh, most people thought that we were a bunch of dope addicts and that we were long-haired hippies and that we were up to no good. What, I don't know what's going on there. They must be selling dope or something because all these cars are parked there all the time. Having orgies. And, <laughs> but they, they thought the worst. And uh, of course we didn't call them and we didn't call the press because we knew that the artists who came there didn't want to be bothered with signing autographs and making pictures with Grandma and all that stuff. <laughs> so they didn't, uh, we didn't, we didn't, we never notified the press when we had a session. Now looking back, it might have been a mistake because we consequently are starting to hurt a little bit, or have been hurting for the last 15 years, 20 years maybe. And, uh, and it's because we didn't take advantage of what we had and let the world know that we were down here doing what we were doing. Coincidental. It sounded good, so why move them? Mm -hmm. That sounded good to yeah. us in our minds. Yeah, it was, it was, the place was so small, you really couldn't move anything anywhere. Mm -hmm. Once we got it to sound where, where it was sounding good, it had to stay because there was nowhere else to move. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in, my, in my case at Fame, uh, I moved stuff all over the place because I tried to the drums over in this corner, as Roger recalls, mm -hmm. and then I tied them in the middle of the floor, and then I built booths and this and that and other. And so we, but when we found places, and I'm sure they did the same thing, that they sounded good, the best we could get them, then we didn't bother them anymore, and, and we wouldn't allow anybody to move them, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, recently I went and I did a, I did a session, a part, a small session, and put the drummer in the booth <laughs> for the first time in, I guess, 10 years. And, and it sounded wonderful. And I couldn't believe it. I said, well, you know what? I should have been, all the hits I cut back in those days, Roger was usually in a booth of some mm -hmm. sort. Yeah, it didn't have- Burning a, up, burning it, up. It didn't have Sweating. glass. Sweating. Like, it didn't, I don't think it had glass there for a while, uh -uh. so. It, mm -mm. Well, it was just open, but it was yeah. a booth. Mm -hmm. And you were sitting over in it and the bass player was, but next to my right. Yeah, yeah I could sit up there and look down on the drums, which was great. Mm -hmm. Couldn't help but play together when you could see each other. But Tom Dowd had a lot of influence on me and my productions and told me a lot of little shortcuts and things because he was producing with an eight track recorder in New York City with Wexler long before I came into the picture. And he had a lot of little shortcuts to do things. And I, I took a lot of, lot from him. I, I never saw another producer or engineer that I had that much trust in, but I don't know who they use, but y'all were getting great sounds. They were getting great, great records. Well, yeah, Steve Melton and Jerry Masters. Greg. Marlon Green was yeah. the first <coughs> That's right. engineer. Greg yeah. Ham. If you can make a record like Rick did, which was just a few microphones and a, what, what was the, what was that place that building? What was the, the building? Tobacco the old, the old Jim Saliba tobacco and uh -huh. candy warehouse. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. So you can't really call it that a studio, but he made a studio of it. It's, a, it's just whatever you make of what you have to work with. Mm -hmm. We didn't have much back then, but but. My studio, when I built it, uh, I was into doing songs and writing songs and taking songs to Nashville and getting cuts by Roy Orbison and Brenda Lee and George Jones and people like that. And so I, I became quite acquainted with the Shelby Singletons, the Owen Bradleys, the, you know, the, the people in Nashville. And they only had two studios there when I started. R.C. Victor had B, and Owen Bradley's studio was later be to become CBS's studio. And so Owen was nice enough to tell me the dimensions to build my studio. So when I built it from scratch, we built it out of cinder blocks, and it was to be 20 feet wide, 20 feet tall, and 70 feet long. And 25 or 30 feet of that, 20 feet of that was 
was the control room. So, and no two walls should have been parallel. But we didn't know if it would be a great sound or not. So, but it turned out, it turned out great. And he told me how to build the echo chamber and he showed me his echo chamber and he had it padlocked so that nobody could find out his secrets and all that stuff. But he was nice enough to me to, and I've always been grateful to him for that, you know. I can hear it every time. When I, when I hear one of those yeah, songs. Yeah, echo chamber. I can hear it. I can pick that echo chamber yes, out. Yes, sir, I can too. Jimmy, you probably can too. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I bet he can. Yeah. I want to ask you, if you don't mind, let me ask Jimmy something here. Fortune Teller was one of my favorite records of all time. Now, how did that come about, Jimmy? <laughs> I, think, I think you were engineering it or something. And no, actually, you were. Yeah, was I? I you you were, were the engineer. Well, uh, what it was, uh, my band, the Delrays. The Del mm -hmm. I love that record. We come and rented the studio from you, and and we had we had uh, horn players come in. Yeah. And we, they played with a lot us of shakers live. <laughs> yeah, Roger played uh, shakers on it. That's the only way I could get in. And uh, John Daniel <laughs> on drums, and we had uh, Billy Scott on the piano. We had uh, Larry York on bass. That, that, that was a good sounding record always to me, and I always mm. thought of that, and I still think of that. Rick in the early pitched days. it to Atlantic and got it on APCO for us. Yeah. Uh, but they snatched it right up. They said, hey, sounds like a hit record to us. Yeah. When, when he came to town, he was real easy going, but at the same time, you knew that he could be pretty rough at, you know. Wexler? Yes. Yeah. And, uh, but what he, what he did, the first person I worked for like that, he really seemed to praise the musicians more than he, now that I look back, than he actually had to. But, you know, he, he knew how to make the musicians feel good and put them in a comfortable position mm -hmm. as long as they were doing what he was liking. <laughs> then if, if, you, if you didn't, you'd have to figure out something else. <laughs> but that's the way of anybody. <laughs> For my part, with Jerry, he was, in my mind, was then and still is, the greatest uh, record executive I've ever met. He was the guy who came to you and brought the songs, or brought and got involved, and sat in the studio with you all day, and watched the guys play and observed what was happening. He was all over it, all about music. And of course, he he beat me up a lot. He was, uh, I was kind of a uh, a fresh young man, you know, and I, I was really bad bad news back then. So. Uh, and he uh, he kicked my butt a lot, but he taught me a lot of good lessons. Uh, but I thought he was a great salesman. He could get records played on radio stations, and he just had this he just had this voice, little guy, Rick. You know, I think this is the number one record, and I and, you know we should run with it. And everybody in the room, of course, agreed with him. You know, mm -hmm. but. But I saw him go into the musicians. These guys have probably been involved in some of these situations. And they'd be saying to me, we're not cutting this song no more. Not necessarily these guys, but I've, I've, over, over the years. Never we're not cutting of, this song no that. more. I, ha I hate this song and we, we, we're, we're tired and we want to go eat and so and so and so and so. And he could come back in and say, Boys, let's get this thing on. I mean, this this is great. We're gonna have a hit record here, and everybody just flock into the studio and ne never heard any, any anything else out of them. It was like, it was like uh, Jesus had came in and spoke, you know. So they were ready to go. Not necessarily these guys, but, but a lot us. of people. <laughs> yeah. Not 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 these guys, but a lot of people would do that. They, he had that charm about him, that he could get things done when nobody else could. And, and of course, me and him fought all the time. We always fought. I was uh, one thing I saw him contribute when we started doing Aretha. He would, he decided that she was going to play piano on this record, and that was the greatest move you could have ever made. 
with her doing her own piano. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that set her up for the rest and up till now. I mean, I mean, she's the best piano player you can ever imagine to work with. I'll tell you. Yeah, well, she plays great. piano for herself. So. That's it. Yeah, she played it, and Spooner and other people had to blend into what she was doing. Spooner that would was good. follow with the organ and electric piano, and it was a perfect match with her. Yeah, absolutely. But he was, uh, they complimented each other, both of them. Uh, a lot Pete, of them. Gerald Jamont Pete on Carr. bass. Pete Carr on guitar. Mm -hmm. Tommy Cogbill. Tommy Cogbill on bass. Chips Moman. Chips Moman on guitar. And Incredible. Reggie Young. Reggie Young on guitar, yes. Um, we had a lot of great people who would come and go. Uh, if we needed them, we'd call them. If we didn't need them, we'd use what we had. Don't you know? forget Joe South. Oh, Joe South was a great songwriter, a great musician, and a great record producer. Mm -hmm. And he did Down in the Boondocks, uh, Games People Play, uh, Walk a Mile in My Shoes, and hundreds of other hit, big hit records. Bill Lowry was with me. He came and did a lot of stuff with me and was the first guy, even before Jerry, he came and did the Tams and, and Jerry Reed and he brought Elvis, I mean, Elvis is later producer, Felton Jarvis and... Uh, Felton brought Tommy Rowe from... Tommy Miami. Rowe and yeah. he, he brought a lot of artists there. Yeah. We were big buddies and he he was he was kind of like my tutor. He, I'd, I'd call him when I, did, when I had a question. How much did you sell a record for? Forty-five and how? How many free goods? How many free goods can you give away and that kind of stuff? But I'm gonna call it like it really is. Rick taught us more than anything. Thank you, Jim, you know? Jimmy. I and, appreciate uh, that. Without Rick's guidance, it would have never happened. Well, I'm gonna tell you something. Without without these guys, we wouldn't have ever had the tremendous amount of successes we did. At the time, it broke my heart that they left. But at the time, also, if they hadn't have left when they did and started their own thing and cut all these great records, and I was across town cutting other great records, well, combined, it meant more to Muscle Shows and its music than just what I would have done. So it was important we left. Very important. Yeah, I thought it was. Not that I wanted you to leave, but it was, right. it was important. Take it up. 72, I believe, number one record producer in the world, according to Billboard, but yeah. that's been a long time. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but deservedly <laughs> so. You did a lot of good stuff back then. So, both. Why here is because I think we wanted it more than anybody else in the world. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We worked harder, longer, tried harder, and was more concerned about our product than anybody in the world. That's right. And, and, and I don't think it had anything to do with the water or the <laughs> wind blowing <laughs> or the north building. or south or the building or anything else. <laughs> it was these human beings right here uh, that, and, you know, and others, a lot of others that we can't, that, that, that not here. Those two people, Rick Hall and Jerry Wexler, and then the people that really helped the musicians was the, was the first group, David and Putnam and Kerrigan. They taught us that we could do it. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. And so I think you know, all that came together, it gave us the confidence we felt like we could follow because when Rick, he picked us because we were the only ones left. And uh, thank God it worked, you know. Yeah, it worked. It worked picked us up off the street. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Bought us some clothes. <laughs> some clothes. I mean, what, Rick, us, you know, what Roger some... said one time was out in front of Fame, and we're standing there kicking the, the rocks, and uh, the rocks. Roger said, you know, said if I could make $100 a week, I'd be happy for the rest of my life. <laughs> I ain't never let him forget it. <laughs> never let him forget it. <laughs> See, you're making $100 a week. Yeah, <laughs> that was, I mean, just to make $100 a week. Why do you think I left the tire store? <laughs> I, I wasn't making $100 a week at the tire store. And my daddy right. owned the store. <laughs> That's right. But we, we were thinking, this better be really, really good. And you know what? It wasn't. It wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Wexler was in the hospital. 
You know, yeah, he, he had did. appendicitis or uh, something. Yeah. And he oh, here so in we, this town, that's right. Yeah, and, you yeah. know, he, had, he, he, did. he wasn't on the session because he was in the hospital. And so that was kind of a bad sign just right from the start. But, you know, he really bragged about the doctor he got in Florence. He really did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he was. So y'all rocked along for close to a year before R.B. Green's session. When about eight you, months. When, yeah. when you cut that, did you know it was a hit? I didn't, but I knew that it was really good. I it knew was good. Something it, had happened. You know, it didn't have the horns on it when we yeah. when we that cut was it. That the first they, take. They uh, they they you know. they added those horns, and when you heard it with the horns, it sounded great. But the bare track, it was not that. It was a good song, though. Yeah, and it it uh, it took about fifteen minutes to make that track. And I mean, for whatever that's worth, I mean, it just sometimes it goes and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, most of our best records yeah. are first or second mm -hmm. takes. I mean, uh, yeah. Well, the Osmonds that came quite a bit later, in in the mid '70s. Well, from '72 to about '75. Uh, I was in Los Angeles. And somehow I ran, somebody introduced me to Mike Curb, who was, they were signed to. And Mike said, I want you to go with me to Las Vegas to hear a group, a new group. And I said, I'm, I'm tired, I want to go home, and I've, I've been out here for a couple of weeks or whatever. And I said, I, I don't want to go. And he said, well, I want you to go because there's somebody special that I want you to see. And so he finally convinced me to go with him, and he said, we'll come back tonight, and you can go home early in the morning. And so I went over there with him. We rode the plane over there with him, and we got there, and uh, we went to Caesar's Palace, and we saw uh, there was Frank Sinatra and Nancy Sinatra, his daughter, Jerry, Jerry Lewis, the comedian, and Jose Feliciano was was the act on that night. And then the Osmonds were the last ones to come out. <coughs> At the time, they were on the on national television and been on for a, a year or two, and and I didn't know anything about television. I mean, I didn't, I didn't have time back then. Y'all know, none of us had time to watch television and watch groups at night. Most of our recording was done at night. And so I didn't even know who they were. I never heard of them. And uh, he said, uh, so they came out and they were like stair steps, you know. And they had these Elvis big white collars and white suits and flashing, you know, and all kinds of little flashing lights on and all that stuff. And and they sang, he ain't heavy, he's my brother, a cappella. I mean, a five-part harmony, a cappella. And all of them could read music. I mean, I mean, you could put sheet music in front of them, they could just right one time, they were ready to go. So they they uh, they did He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother in Acapella, and I was sold. I was the hey, man, this is incredible. Because I was looking for a, a white act that could do something similar to the Jackson 5, because the Jackson 5 was, were tearing it up all over the United States. And I was thinking, well, if I could find a white group that looked good to do that kind of stuff, I could cut a hit record because I had a lot of black songwriters. George Jackson was one of them, of course, and y'all had the big one with him. But uh, he wrote One Bad Apple and brought the song down to me. Him and Mickey had done it in Nashville in the studio in Memphis in the studio I just built up there. And uh, it was key to bar the doors, I mean, from then on. And we decided to split them off and make Donnie in one group, one act, and, and the Osmonds, the brothers, four of them, uh, another act. So they doubled up on the sales and the whole thing. So it was it was a good thing. Yeah, it also sold quite a few. I mean, do you have any idea what the sales figures are? About 25 million albums and worldwide. And they we had three or four number one records, and I... And then Mike decided that he wanted to save money, so he reduced my royalties, and and, and I quit. <laughs> Never lived that down. 
since. Well, I, 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 I thought the Osmond stuff was incredible. Bobby Gentry, I did a great side on her, and I did uh, patches with Clarence Carter, which I was very, very fond of. And so I had several that, uh, and You're Having My Baby, Paul Anka went number one. So we had a lot of number one records. But it wasn't like with them, mm -hmm. I'd bring in this piano player from Memphis and this guy from Nashville and this guy from so-and-so. So it wasn't really the same group going in every day doing the same kind of uh, basic stuff, you know, and I, it, it was terrible. It was hard. It was really hard. Tough. Andy well, Mitchell, I remember playing with him over at Quinn, Quinn Ivy's That's right. Uh, that was in 1967. A song was called Alice or Alice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the album was like from Memphis to London or something. Eddie and Michelle. he didn't even record it in Memphis. He recorded it in Muscle Shows, but it was at Quinn Ivy Studios. Mm -hmm. they, they, would, they would come because they would hear, I believe, because they, they would hear these different th these these guys doing all this work in the studio and they're right, right. Uh, eager to please and but and then after us having a, a couple of hits made in our studio mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing that Jerry Wexler helped us a lot with he knew Jan Winter who had Rolling Stone magazine still does mm -hmm. and uh, that kind of circulation uh, was good for us because uh, Jerry would compliment us in these articles in Rolling Stone magazine, uh, and I think that had a lot to do with it, too. Well, Blackwell brought, uh, I guess it was Jimmy Cliff he brought first, first mm -hmm. and uh, liked what we were doing with Jimmy Cliff, and I think that's how the traffic guys heard us was on the Jimmy Cliff records. Like Rick said, we didn't, we weren't smart enough to publicize ourselves. We wouldn't tell anybody that the Rolling Stones recorded in our studio because they asked us not to. And we didn't uh, tell anybody that traffic was recording in our studio. It even said recorded at Strawberry Hill Studios, Jamaica. And we went along with that. And I think those are little mistakes we made. We should have said, yeah, we won't tell. And then we should have told. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. You know, we need to publicize ourselves. <laughs> we didn't either. We, we thought, just like the guy say, uh, Mac Davis, Osmond, nobody wanted to be tell, us to tell anybody. And in fact, we, we had guards on the door when the Osmonds were recording there to keep people out, kids from coming in. And uh, if we had it to do over again, it would be a different story. We would, uh, I would, I'd let the world know. I mean, I. You know, <laughs> helicopters flying. Yeah, over exactly. There. <laughs> helicopters, newspaper men all, all over the place. <laughs> Free food for the helicopter and, 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 and board for for news <coughs> news people. That whole thing. Jealous boat. Well, to begin with, Spooner wrote some of my favorite songs right from the get go. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. Mm -hmm. You know, he and Dan. Yeah, him and Dan were key. Mm -hmm. Key writers for this area for a long time. In fact, long when time. Spooner left to go to Memphis, we didn't know what we were going to do. You know, as far as getting a keyboard player, we we're so fortunate that, that Barry came along. But we right. tried Marvell Thomas. We tried a lot he of other people. Down there. He wouldn't move. And he was good. Yeah. Yeah. Back in that day, uh, Dan and I were well, late sixties, mid sixties. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Dan and I were writing for Rick's. Fame Publishing Company, you know, a couple of years there, exclusive mm -hmm. writers, and, and we had some of our first songs out of there, like uh, Take Me Just As I Am, I'm Your Puppet. I don't, I really don't remember the titles. I, I mean, uh, we wrote several songs that did well, but. Did great, yeah. You know, we had fun, hopefully, playing them, because yeah. these guys all played on them. And the, yeah. the, records and the demos, but, you know, I wouldn't write them, that'd be fun. Then I would have like a guitar and a piano, and then the next day or two, all these guys come in, we'd play it as a band and have mm -hmm. fun with them. And, all that uh, Take Me Just As I Am, that was the first record that I, that on the radio, that the first time that I ever appeared on the radio was sort of one of Spooner's songs, uh, uh, Take Me Just As I Am, with Dan Penn singing it, mm -hmm. who 
they changed the name a lot to they changed this name to Lonnie Ray mm -hmm. <laughs> because Lonnie Ray sounded a little bit more black and and, and Dan sounded black and Dan yeah. sounded mm -hmm. black mm -hmm. and I, I, I just that just amazed me I, I was working in a body shop uh, and I was uh, outside and I was taking a <laughs> bumper I mean, yeah, a bumper <laughs> off of an old Buick and uh, getting it ready to paint and I was down there on the on the uh, uh, ground trying to get this bumper loose with clods of clods of red clay you know falling in my face and I heard that thing on the radio and oh it excited me and I thought oh take me just as I am Lonnie Ray oh that's me playing I love it <laughs> and so I, I got out from under that old car and, I, and the, the guy who ran the body shop, I said, I said, this, listen, this is me. This is me playing on that. He says, <laughs> yeah, said, yeah, yeah. He says, yeah, you better get back out there. Mr. So-and-so is going to pick that, try and pick up that car on Thursday. <laughs> so, so he wasn't impressed. No. <laughs> Excuse me. What were your impression of the Staple Singers when they first came to the studio? I loved them. They, yeah. were, they were happy. They were, uh, and Pop Staples, he was real easy going, and the the the, the, the sisters, they, they were easy going. They were fun to hang out with. They were fun to be with. <coughs> fun to I, be I remember with. Mavis was saying, "We're gonna cut a hit," you know, and I'm thinking, "Well, we want to do that," you mm -hmm. know, We'd but like you know, to, we but couldn't but promise. But, but I'm not sure. But by golly, we did. <laughs> yeah. you know. And they were trying to go from gospel to to pop or R&B music, and that was really their first venture away from gospel music, and we thought, I don't know. We recorded that. Uh, that wasn't very memorable, as, as I recall, but I remember Al Bell brought in all these songwriters. It was just be one writer after the next. He had them in, had them, uh, had them in car loads off of them. He, had, uh, down from Memphis. he had, uh, had everybody staying at the Holiday Inn. And he would take tracks over to the holiday and, and play them to all these riders. And then the riders would get, the, they were literally being written Inspired. <laughs> after and before the, <laughs> the tracks. I mean, it was a little, uh, a little song mill going on there for a while. And uh, one week we recorded, I think it was 50 or 60 tracks mm. for, for them. Was that right, Jimmy? Yeah. At, uh, I mean, it would be songwriter after the song. One leave, the next would come in. It wouldn't be even a song. They would have the chords and maybe the idea I'll of a song. I'll take you there was not a song when we cut the track. <laughs> well, the, the thing I recall about the Staple Singers was I'll take you there, of course. But yeah. I was taken immediately when I heard it by Roger's drum lick. <laughs> the thing, you know, and I said, I've never heard anything. Little David. Like and, 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 and David, of course, well, I was taken by the whole record, but, but the mm. thing that stood out in my mind was I had never heard a drum with that kind of a groove, which I thought was, was guy, a new thing, a new thing. And, uh, but, I mean, they were, cu they were cutting great stuff. Everything they cut uh, was just, I mean, just... Oh, Rick, just so you know, on I'll Take You There, mm. I tried to put in the bass drum on the two and four, like we Did were talking, <laughs> talking about four <laughs> earlier. I told well, you it wouldn't work. <laughs> and no, it didn't. Yeah. It did not work. But they work. did that on reggae, reggae records, so we thought it yeah, might we work. Thought, yeah, we thought it would work, but I, I, we had to change that real quick. <laughs> it's bogging it down a little bit. <laughs> Matt came in and... His manager, who was Sandy Gallon, who was later to manage everybody, Barbara Streisand, uh, anybody who was anybody, the Allman Brothers and the whole thing. But he, when he came to me, he didn't have anybody except Mac Davis. And he said, Rick, I, and I had met Mac Davis with Bill Lowry because he brought him up there in his entourage and said, I want to cut one side on Mac because he'll get upset if we don't cut him. So he went out in the studio and he sang one song. It was It's a Lover's Question, which was uh, a copy, a, a direct copy. It sounded exactly like 
Clive McLeod, Clive McLeod, McLeod. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so he left, and I never saw Mac for another 10 years after that. Then he comes back, and I call Bill Lauer, and I said, you know, I'm seeing this Mac Davis name on all these hit records. Something's Burning by Kenny Rogers in the fifth edition. Uh, I, 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 you know, and and In the Ghetto by Elvis Presley and, and all these things. And I said, is this the same Mac Davis we know? And he said, that's him. And I said, no, you're kidding. So anyhow, Sandy brought him down and Sandy had quit his job in New York and moved down and said, I want to make him a superstar. And he's going to be a big movie star. He's going to be this and he's going to be all these things. And I said, yeah, yeah well, whatever. You know, uh, but I don't have time for him because I... I don't think he's a singer. I think he's a stylist, but I don't think he's a record. He's, he's a, somebody we sell records on. And he said, uh, well, if you'll cut three sides on him, I'll get him a deal with Clive Davis. I've already set it up, and, and they'll promote the heck out of him, and it'll be a number one record. And so I said, well, Max given all of his great songs away, so I don't have any songs. If I want to do him, I have no songs to cut. And he said, well, he'll write you a hit. You know, I said, really? Get out of here. You know, it's like, well, I can prove this by Spooner. You just don't walk in the studio and write a hit song and come out with it. And Not dependable, I <laughs> No, that wasn't, wasn't very dependable. So I knew that a songwriter, a great songwriter, could write a, a number one record about every five years. And the rest of the time, they'd be mediocre, but they wouldn't be big. So Max said, I said, we don't have any songs. And... So he said, I'll leave Mac down here and you and him work together and he'll write us a hit song and you go ahead and cut him. And uh, I said, well, fine. If he wants to stay down here, that's fine. So Mac stayed down here and stayed three or four days and we w listened to every song he had, Sarah Between the Lines and everything he had. Uh, and I said... Uh, and he had, he had one song I liked a lot called Whoever Finds This, I Love You. It was about a little orphan girl in an orphan's home, and she kept sticking notes through the, through the cracks of the wrought iron fence, hoping somebody would pick her up and take her home with them. But, uh, but he, he couldn't write it. And I said to him, uh, I said, I need a song with a hook in it. I mean, I really need a big hook, a song with a hook in it. A sound hook or a lyric hook or some kind of a hook where when you hear it, you say, man, I, that, that's a, I love that record. And so he said, well, so he'd go across the hallway over there and he'd write and smoke two or three packs of cigarettes and he'd come back and he'd sing me a song and I'd say, that ain't it. And so he got, he got really upset and he went back over there and he said, I'll write you a damn song with a hook in it. You want a song with a hook in it? I'll write you one. <laughs> so he went back over there, and he came back over there, and he sung me, Baby Don't Get Hooked on Me. <laughs> and he sung one verse in the chorus, and he said, What do you think? And I said, Number one record. He said, you got to be kidding. I said, No, I think it's number one record. He said, Well, I can't finish the song. I said, What do you mean you can't finish the song? He said, I said everything I wanted to say in the first verse and chorus. So there's nothing else to write about. I've, I've told it all. So I said, well, you can do it. You can. I said, take the track. And he said, I said, we're cutting in the morning. And he said, well, what, what am I going to sing? And he, I said, just sing the same verse and chorus over and over. And we'll cut the track, and then you can take it home with you, and you can finish writing the song. A couple of weeks he come back and we put him on the song. Of course, the rest was history. It was the number one record, and the first we had with Clive Davis. And of course, Clive and I became like that, and everything was hunky dory. So I did more sides with Clive with Mac Davis than I did with anybody else I ever produced. Do you have any idea what the number? We 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 did about five or six albums, and back then it was like ten ten to twelve songs on an album. So I did about, uh, oh, I guess, 60 songs on it. For the co-production was mostly words only. Uh, 
well, maybe we were co-producers in a lot of ways. We're more arrangers, I believe, than anything else. But uh, uh, there wasn't a lot of deals like that. There was, there was one with uh, uh, Paul Simon, which didn't work out. Uh, you know, got the contract this high, but you know, there was no need for it because we didn't get paid, or maybe a little. We had one with Atlantic Records, and uh, uh, because we did a lot of tracks, and we didn't really get paid hardly anything for that either. Uh, the the one that did work for us, and that was no contract, it was done on a handshake, was uh, uh, Bob Seger. It was. Uh, done a handshake outside the studio and to sp split uh, uh, for Barry, David, Jimmy, and myself to split 1%. And Jimmy can tell you the rest on how that happened, wherever he is. Well, <laughs> we, uh, it worked so well, we started doing it with everybody. And, uh, and the way we put it to them was, we call it an incentive percentage. That if we cut a hit, we get to share a little bit with you. But it don't cost you any more, you know, if we don't cut a hit. I mean, we're not going to charge, we're going to charge you the same session cost. Oh, there's a confusion and, there with uh, with uh, Bob Seeger and his manager. It's the Oh yeah, that confusion. Well, See, that's what brought them. about that. Uh, See, deal. they came With there in uh, Brad and Brad Dave. and Dave. Uh, is Brad Shapiro and Dave Crawford. Uh, Dave Crawford producing it? Well, they had the wrong layout on how they were going to. Well, one, one thing too, the manager uh, uh, Punch Punch Andrews, he thought that uh, a side. What we call sides, how many sides did you cut today, Rick? Well, I did about five, did about three or four sides today. <laughs> Those are songs. But, so the manager had it budgeted out for a side of an album and a side of a side two of the album. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. then he was off the Instead using. of 10 times. And yeah. so mm -hmm. the money ran out, I mean, after, real, after real, two songs. <laughs> after two songs. <laughs> not, I mean, not, not, not as exciting. <laughs> so immediately, so, uh, Dave Crawford and them quit. <laughs> that's great. They Pack quit. Up and leave. And then uh, I, I think it was Jimmy that uh, was. Said, said, you know, uh, Bob, you know, we'll, we'll finish, finish your album for you. Well, actually, what happened? Punch asked me, he said, Bob really liked working with you guys. Would y'all work with him on an album? I said, well, we'd have to speak with, you know, Crawford about it and uh, Shapiro. And if they're okay with it, we'll do it. And I called them and they said, hey, y'all go to it. You know, and so mm -hmm. we did. And it's been, one, it's been lasted over 30 years. But it was a handshake deal, wasn't it? It was. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and they, were, they were true to the state. Back in the early days, for us, the money was punch it, Andrews it was, 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 was good we for never us. missed a statement but it, it after all these years it's never you know started out big many years ago ended up little you know these years <laughs> but it, that's the only thing only time I've ever heard of any kind of deal that that happened where somebody just said yeah we'll finish it for you so <laughs> let's go ahead and, and actually pay money. you <laughs> yeah. that's amazing yeah mm -hmm. well I, in my part I had the same kind of situation with Etta James, and we cut a big hit record on her with Tell Mama, and I never got it. I've never saw a dime to this day on that record, or anything she ever did mm -hmm. on Chess Records. And of course, at the time, I thought, well, maybe they'll pay me next year, and you put it off and put it off, and you don't want to make trouble, and you get, you start getting blamed for, well. This guy will sue you. He's he mean. Negative, <laughs> negative guy. Neg negative guy. You know, he, he, he'll, he'll, he'll sue you and blah, blah, blah. And uh, so I just backed off from that kind of stuff. i got to tell you a story that I called Mike Mayer one time, who was one of my lawyers that helped me a lot in the music business and was also Atlantic's lawyer for a long time. And Jerry introduced me to him and said, you, you need this guy because he's young and he's aggressive and he's really a sharp guy. And so uh, he said, 
So I hired him and started working with him, along with Jerry. He kept kept him working on with him because I couldn't afford him, you know. But uh, he he uh, he taught me a lot of stuff about making deals and things like that. But but mine come just like theirs did from hardships, you know. He didn't get paid for two or three records. I mean, you you, or you had to fly to Los Angeles to 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 go up and sit in. Mike Curve's office all day long in order to get a, a small check for ten thousand dollars for studio time that he'd owed you for the last six months, and he was he was a tough nut. He was a tough nut. He didn't want to pay anybody, and you found a lot of them like that. I mean, not that we were looking for them, but they they were there, you know. <laughs> Jerry. Yes, Jerry was a fun guy. He was he was my dear friend all of his life, and his wife. She sang background. Vocals in Nashville, and, and Jerry did, had, was coming off of a big, big movie, and uh, I went to Jerry, Jerry uh, Bradley, who was, at the time was the president of R.C. Victor in Nashville, and said, I want to do a country act. Uh, you got somebody I can do? And he said, he threw me the roster and said, pick anybody you want on there. I said, oh, well, I ain't, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm not. I said, what I want you to do is call them up and we'll have lunch together or something. We can talk and get acquainted and we'll f see if we got anything in common. And he said, all right. He said, uh, but I, I said, what about, he said, who, who would you like to do? I said, well, I'm kind of known as a funky record producer. I don't produce hard country stuff, fiddles and harmonicas, you know. And he said, I said, what about Jerry Reed? He said, I'd love for you to do Jerry Reed. He said, man, that would be wonderful. So I came back and did She Got the Gold Mine and I Got the Shaft, and which was a huge record. And we, we probably cut it in 15 minutes. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't play on it, but I can hear the energy in it. Yeah, uh, it, it was just one of those quick things. You yeah. know, we just one time through, and you, I had, had all the ideas in my head. It, and of course, it was a little bit of a steal off of uh, the devil went down to Georgia and that kind of thing, you know, and smoke, smoke, smoke that cigarette and all that stuff. So he he was a joy to work with. He was a fun guy. What you saw is what you got. What you see on television is the way he was in the studio. And uh, I, so I asked Bradley, I said, look, he was the head of the company. I said, is there anything that I know what I want to do, but is there anything that you don't want me to do? And he said, well, yeah, I want one thing, two things I want. I don't want him, tell him to leave his pipe at the, at, and don't go, take his pipe in the studio and tell him don't bring his guitar to the studio and, 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 and you can't have horns on anything. You cut with him. So, like a fool, I, I called him in and said, look, I talked to Brad, and he wants he, he's there's certain things I want you to know about it, the deal. And he said, "What are they?" And I said, "Well, I think he said, what are they, horse?'" And I said, uh, "Well, he don't. I don't want you. To, I said I'm going to give nine pints of blood for you. I'm going to cut your hit record, but I want you to do me a favor. And this is not for me; it's from the company. Don't bring your pipe to the studio. Don't." bring your guitar to the studio and and we won't have any horns on any of thing we, we cut on you. But he jumped up and took off out. He got in his car and left and went to Nashville. He come back a couple of days later and said, Well Hoss, I've thought about it. And said, Man, we're friends and he said, Whatever you said, you got it. Let's do it. And so we had we had a ball. We had a ball together.